in uh, my estimation, I think he probably lacks some discernment, right? There's this guy in the Old Testament named Joseph, and it's clear from the outset that Joseph is his father's favorite. In fact, the text in Genesis tells us that uh, because Joseph was uh, given to Jacob as he was well along in years, that uh, Joseph had a special place in his heart. And I I don't know if Jacob just loved family conflict or what, but he decides in all that wisdom to give Joseph uh, what we often call when we tell the story to kids, the coat of many colors, right? Now, a coat of many colors like this is expensive because dye was not readily available. And so this was a significant, significant gift to Joseph. Now, Joseph is already unliked by his brothers, right? Because he's clearly dad's favorite. And what happens as the story unfolds is that Joseph starts to have these dreams that are are prophetic. He doesn't know it yet. But in Genesis 37, he has this dream that sheaves of wheat that are his representative of his brothers bow down to him. Now, here's just a, a family coaching moment. If you have a dream that your siblings are bowing down to you, I wouldn't go tell your siblings, yo, I had this dream and you were worshiping me. Literally the text, if you read Genesis 37, it says, and they hated him all the more. That's not how you begin a good season of someone's story, right? They hated him all the more. He has not one, but two dreams where his family bows down to him and his brothers, like the sibling rivalry just keeps ratcheting up. And finally they get to this place where where the brothers are out in the field watching the flocks. and, And Jacob says to Joseph, I want you to go check on your brothers. And in Genesis 37, verse 19, we pick up that story. This is uh, the brothers as they see Joseph coming. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices and balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. Now, this is just a bizarre part of the story, right? They see Joseph coming. And and so they they take his coat of many colors off and they throw him into the cistern. and, And I found this so just weird. They ate lunch. Did you notice that? Like they threw their brother into a pit and it's like, man, after stealing his robe and throwing him in the pit, I'm hungry. You you hungry? Let's eat lunch. So literally they're eating lunch while their brother is sitting in the cistern. And and I don't know how close they are. Maybe they're in earshot. And so Joseph can hear their conversation. Number one, imagine the traumatic nature of already having your brothers attack you, take off this robe that they know is of significance to your family. And then they throw you in a cistern. Already that's traumatic, but maybe he can hear their conversation. And one of his brothers goes, I mean, we could kill him, but I don't, we don't get anything from that. And they see this caravan of traders and they go, why don't we sell him into slavery? And, and there's a cold heart and like they're literally eating lunch with their brother in a pit. Like we're not going to benefit if we kill him. Let's sell him. I mean, the, this whole thing is like family trauma and family conflict. And so they sell Joseph into slavery. Now, if you read the story, you know that for Joseph, he enters a season of significant challenge and significant suffering. For a while, he becomes a, a well-known servant in the house of a well-known man named Potiphar until he's falsely accused of trying to rape Potiphar's wife. She actually tries to seduce Joseph, but when he flees and runs away, she steals his uh, cloak and frames him for this uh, crime. Joseph spends years in, in prison, in an Egyptian prison. After he is finally released by the grace of God, he finds favor with the Pharaoh as he interprets one of the dreams for the Pharaoh. And Joseph rises to a significant position of power and influence in Egypt because he warns Pharaoh of a, of a famine that's coming as he interprets Pharaoh's dream. Now, as the story continues, there's this moment where Joseph is, he's second in command in all of Egypt, right underneath the Pharaoh, and the famine has struck the land. Now, Joseph's brothers, 
In this season of famine, they turn to Egypt because under Joseph's leadership, Egypt is the only place that actually has food. And so they become a resource to the entire Mediterranean uh, world, basically. So Joseph's brothers, they're desperate for food. They come to Egypt and lo and behold, later in Genesis, there's this moment where Joseph's brothers are standing in front of Joseph, who's now sitting on a throne. And you can imagine what's going through Joseph's mind. Right? It seems like a moment ripe for revenge. He's sitting in the position of power. His brothers are in a place of need. They don't even recognize that it's him yet. And here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to place yourself in the story and go, how would you respond? Now, one of the things I've noticed about our culture is we love a good revenge story. Look at how many of our movies are about revenge and how many of our movies have us rooting for, for really somebody who's doing ethically terrible things, but because they're taking revenge on the bad person, we find ourselves rooting for these people in these morally compromised moments because we love to see revenge happen. Now, here's Joseph. He's in a position where he could take revenge. How would he respond? How might you respond? So here's my question this morning, church. In a culture consumed by revenge and retribution, how do we walk in the way of forgiveness? In a culture consumed by revenge and retribution, how do we walk in the way of forgiveness? Now, he, here's the reality in Scripture. As followers of Christ, we are called to forgive. Last week, we ended looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Let me just read that again for us. Ephesians 4, 32 says this, Be kind and compassionate with one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Likewise, in Colossians 3, and this is all over the New Testament, Colossians 3, 13, Bear with each other, Paul says, and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of scripture is this call for the people of God to be a people who live and walk in the way of forgiveness. Now, as we push into this question, the, the question rises, well, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is this. To forgive is to release an offense and no longer hold it against the offender, but rather to walk in the way of love for them. Let me say that again. To forgive is to release an offense and no longer hold it against the offender, but rather to walk in love for them. And, and I don't know about you, but I struggle with this idea of forgiveness. And part of it, I think we, we struggle with forgiveness because we have these misperceptions of what forgiveness is. He, here's what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not simply forgetting, right? And how, how often do we hear that phrase? Well, you just have to forgive and forget. As we walk through scripture, I think you're going to see church, nowhere are we called to just forget that bad things happen. And yet in forgiveness, we feel like, well, if I'm forgiving, isn't that just a place of passivity? Am I just supposed to pretend like an offense didn't happen? Forgiveness is not denying that something wounding took place. Forgiveness is not passivity. Forgiveness does not overlook the offense. It's this decision in the grace of Jesus Christ to say, yes, this hurts. Yes, I'm wounded, but I'm choosing by the grace of God not to hold it against you as something you need to repay me for. So how is forgiveness possible and why should we forgive? Let's, let's look at Matthew 18, this teaching of Jesus. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. What a parable. What a parable. 
And, and then it starts with, with Peter who asks this question of Jesus. He goes, Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive my brother or sister? And, and if you read the gospels, I, I both love and feel bad for Peter. Peter's the guy who's always trying to get it right. He wants to be a man who uh, appears to have substance and depth. And so he goes, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? Should I forgive them seven times? Now, Peter's not just making up a random number in the Talmud, which is a, actually I have it in my office. It's 30 volumes of the rabbinical tradition passed down from the Babylonian exile up until the time of Jesus. There's this uh, teaching in the Talmud that says from a rabbi, if your brother or sister sins against you, forgive them three times. Now, Peter, he's astute, and he knows, okay, Jesus is pretty uh, merciful. He goes, I'll double it and add one. The number seven has significance in Jewish culture and context. It's a number of perfection. It's a number of wholeness. And so Peter goes, I know the answer. Jesus, I should forgive my brother seven times. And, and I think Peter's inside is like, I got it. This is the right answer. I'm so good at this. And Jesus goes, ah, he goes, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, Jesus is not saying like, you should have a clicker click. Like when somebody offends you, you're like, ah, bro, you're on number 60. You've got 17 left and then we're done. Right? That's not, that's not what Jesus is saying. When, when Jesus says the number 77, he's saying, Peter, stop keeping score. He's saying, Peter, d don't keep a tally of how many times you've forgiven your brother or sister. What he's saying is that forgiveness is to be a continual pattern. It is the disposition of who we are and how we live. And, and then Jesus tells this parable, right? He, and, and the parable begins with this phrase, as many of the parables do, the kingdom of heaven is like. R read through Matthew sometime, and, and as you read the parables, notice that Jesus begins most of them with that phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. And when Jesus uses that phrase, he's saying, here's what God is like. When everything is rightly submitted to the rule and reign of God, here's what it's like. The kingdom of heaven will look like this. And he says, there's this master who was settling his accounts and he calls in this servant and this servant owes him 10,000 bags of gold. Now, if you're reading in your physical Bible, I want you to just look at the footnotes. The footnote to this says, Greek, 10,000 talents. Catch this. A talent was worth 20 years of a day laborer's wages. One talent was worth 20 years of a day laborer's wages. This guy owes 10,000 talents. Now, I'm not a math major, but that's something like 200,000 years of a day's wages, right? Jesus uses what is an absurd sum. Like, if you're a Jewish person and you're reading this in that time, you would have almost giggled at that amount. This is like Jesus saying, uh, this man owed him a bajillion gazillion dollars. It's, it's a number that they couldn't even comprehend. He, the debt is so great. And he calls this man before the king and, and, and the man falls at his knees and he goes, I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. But please don't throw my family into prison. I'll repay it. Here's the thing, church. The, 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 the debt is so absurd. The man could never begin to repay. It would take him literal millennia to repay the debt. It can't happen. And notice that as he falls on his knees in front of the master, it says the master took pity on him. And when the master takes pity on him, the master humanizes the man. There, there's compassion. There's mercy. Right? He's threatened to throw the man's family into prison to sell all he has. And this man who was broken and who's destitute and is about to lose everything he loves and cares for, the master sees him suddenly with mercy. And he forgives the debt. Now, what's mind-boggling, church, is that the debt doesn't go away. What the master is saying is, I'm still out 10,000 talents and I'll forgive you and not make you repay that money and the master absorbs the debt. Now, if you're astute, you're realizing that Jesus is proclaiming the gospel. We're told that the wages of sin is death. What we rightly deserve because of our sin and rebellion against God is to be eternally separated from him, is to have no life in him. But uh, Romans tells us that Christ, who was rich in love, uh, died for us even while we were still sinners. And what we believe is that the New Testament teaches that Jesus took on himself the penalty for our sin and God absorbs our debt of sin when Jesus dies on the cross, forgiving our sins. And now there's this servant, right, who turns around. He's been forgiven this enormous debt. Somebody owes him a few hundred silver coins. Not a large debt. 
And this man, he grabs him by the collar and he chokes him and he goes, I'm going to throw you into prison. And he does. He has him in prison because he doesn't want to forgive the debt. And when you see this story, you go, but how? Like you had this massive debt that you couldn't pay that was impossible. It was forgiven and you're going to throw him in prison. And yet church, we do this all the time. We've been forgiven a debt of sin that we could never repay. And yet we turn around and at the offense of our brother and sister, we hold them in a place of anger, vengeance, and hatred. And in the same kind of ridiculousness that you see this uh, a man interacting with in, in this parable is the same kind of like absurdity that we have to see in our own life when we refuse to walk in the way of forgiveness. And, and here's the reality of this parable. When we encounter God's forgiveness, we become forgivers. Did, did you notice Jesus' warning at the end of the parable? He says, in his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured. And catch this. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister. Now, Jesus is not saying that God's ability to forgive us depends on our ability to forgive other people. That would make salvation works oriented. What Jesus is saying is when you refuse to forgive your brother and sister, you are demonstrating in your life that you have failed to receive the grace, mercy, and love that God has so freely offered you. Because when you encounter the transformative forgiveness and mercy of the God of all the universe, your life will be transformed. You want to know if you are walking in Jesus, how is your forgiveness? The way that we forgive and walk in mercy is demonstrative of the transformative power of Jesus Christ in our lives. So let's talk about the dimensions of forgiveness that are fleshed out in this. Right? We talked about Ephesians 4.32, forgive one another just as in Christ God forgave you. The biblical passages on forgiveness always are rooted in God's forgiveness of us. And so as we talk about forgiveness, there, there are three dimensions to forgiveness. The first is the vertical dimension of forgiveness, and it's recognizing that God in Christ Jesus forgives us. And so there's this vertical forgiveness of God to us as his people. God sends his son Jesus to die on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin. We then, church, we have to do the internal work of repenting, of receiving and responding to God's grace. And what happens is that when we encounter that forgiveness, we are transformed. We are not the same. We become a new kind of people. And what happens then is it opens up this horizontal forgiveness. When we have been forgiven and we have repented and received that forgiveness, we are able to offer human forgiveness of other people that is uh, directly rooted in God's forgiveness of us. And the hope is that there can be repentance and reconciliation and new relationship. But all of that is rooted and goes back to the beautiful reality that God has first forgiven us. A couple more passages and some observations about forgiveness. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, and when you stand praying, if you hold something against someone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. So Jesus says you're in a moment of worship and you're praying and you remember that your brother has, has done something to offend you. He says, forgive him. Offer that forgiveness. Luke 17, three through six, Jesus says, so watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Now notice that Jesus tells the disciples to watch themselves. The disciples, when they hear this teaching on forgiveness, they say, Lord, increase our faith. Let me make some observations about this. Number one, forgiveness requires God's grace and mercy to help us. Forgiveness is not something we are trying to work up in our own accord. When we're faced with the responsibility to forgive... I don't try to go, okay, I'm going to try really hard to forgive. No, my posture is one of, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Would you grace me to forgive as I have been forgiven in you? And notice the disciples, when, when they hear this teaching, they say, Lord, increase our faith. They go, we believe, but Jesus, this is asking a lot. You want us to forgive when we've been wronged? When our brother, even seven times, you want us to continue to offer forgiveness? And the disciples' response, I think, should be our response. Lord, help me. Lord, increase our faith. And, and notice, too, Jesus' uh, warning to them. He says, watch yourselves. Tim Keller, in his book, Forgiveness, he, he says this about this passage in Luke. He says, when Jesus says to those wronged, watch yourselves, it means we should assume that we're more resentful and less forgiving and more controlled by what we've done to us than we think we are. I, I thought that was powerful. Jesus is warning the disciples, watch your lives. Be careful what takes root in your heart. 
Be quick to be a people who offer forgiveness. Second observation about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not optional. Right? You look at the parable of the unmerciful servant, you look at Jesus' teaching in Mark, you look at Jesus' teaching in Luke, you look at Peter's teaching, or Paul's teaching in Ephesians and Colossians that we read earlier, and none of those passages do you see like, ah, if you don't feel like it, don't worry about forgiveness. No, forgiveness is not optional for the Christ follower. If you are rooted in relationship with the God of the universe who has forgiven us in Christ Jesus, forgiveness becomes who we must be in Christ. Forgiveness is not something that we get to take off the table. Where we are, are not living out forgiveness, we are living directly in disobedience to God's word. Third observation about forgiveness, we must watch our heart and life closely. To be intentional that no bitter root takes hold. That resentment doesn't callous our heart against forgiveness. So here's the question again. How do we do this? How do we begin to respond in forgiveness? Let's look at the story of Joseph. Genesis chapter 50. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Now remember, they, they threatened to kill him. They threw him in a sister and they sold him into slavery. You can understand why when their father dies, they're worried that they're going to get Joseph's revenge. And now Joseph is a ruler in Egypt. He has a man of significant authority. He can have them killed. He can do whatever he wants. Verse 16. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we're your servants. But Joseph said to them, don't fear for I, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I'll provide for them and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. There, there's so much here that I just find mind boggling. They literally wanted to murder Joseph. And notice how he responds. Number one, and this is how we should respond. Joseph reacted with humility. They're nervous. He, Joseph is going to return evil to us. And notice Joseph's words. He says, am I in the position to act as God in this place? And part of me goes, Joseph, you, you rightly deserve, give them some revenge. And yet Joseph says, I'm not going to stand in judgment over you. And sometimes, church, when we are hurt or wounded or offended, where our pride, our ego has been hurt, wounded, or offended, sometimes our lack of forgiveness is driven by the shame of what happened in the offense. And so we want to get even because we think somehow that will make me not feel as shamed or broken about this thing. The problem is revenge never results in healing. Revenge never results in anything holistic. In fact, as James said last week, anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And yet Joseph reacts with godly humility saying, I'm not going to stand in judgment over you. Part of what's happening then is that Joseph is surrendering justice to God. There's this element where he's saying, I trust God's justice for you and I will not be the arbiter of this justice on God's behalf. Secondly, how do we forgive? React with humility. Secondly, it's okay to recognize the offense. Did you notice what Joseph says in verse 20? He says, as for you, you meant evil against me. Joseph doesn't say, it wasn't a big deal. Joseph doesn't pretend that it didn't happen. Joseph doesn't pretend that it hurt. By the way, did you notice that Joseph broke down and wept? I think partly Joseph weeps. He's grieving the loss of his father. I think partly he weeps because this place of brokenness in the life of him and his brothers is still so raw. And yet when Joseph comes down to it, he reacts with humility and he doesn't say it's fine. He doesn't say it was no big deal. He goes, no, what you did was evil. And in that, Joseph is drawing a boundary saying, this is unacceptable. This isn't something that can continue. What you intended to do was in fact evil. It's okay to recognize the offense. Two, Joseph rests in God's redemptive purpose. Notice what he says again in verse 20. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. It was because of Joseph's leadership in Egypt that the famine didn't take the lives of hundreds and thousands of people. And, and what I find fascinating here is Joseph recognizes you meant evil for me and yet God was able to bring redemptive possibilities out of what you meant for evil. 
And there, there is a surrender here for Joseph to recognize, yes, this thing that happened wasn't right. It wasn't good. It was meant for evil. And yet God was able to redeem it and in his sovereignty to bring good out of it. And so where Joseph reacts with humility, he recognizes the offense, but he rests in God's redemptive purpose, which allows him to, number four, release the debt and forego revenge and retribution. Because Joseph trusts that God is at work, that God will bring justice, because Joseph is able to trust God's redemptive purpose, because he reacts with humility and lets God be God and says, I don't need to revenge myself. He's able to forego revenge and retribution. Did you notice that twice in this passage, he encourages his brothers, he says, don't be afraid. In other words, I'm not going to return evil back to you. And when he not only foregoes revenge and retribution, but number five, he responds in service to and the good of the other. This isn't just passively saying, I'm going to release the offense. No, Joseph turns around and actively serves his brothers. Listen to what he says. He says, don't fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I look at this and I go, what in the world? He comforts his brother. They, they wanted to murder him and he comforts them. They wanted to murder him and he goes, I'm going to take care of your families. I'm going to take care of your little ones. You don't need to fear. I'm going to serve you. And I go, Joseph, you have power now. You have authority now. Bring revenge, bring justice. And, but Joseph refuses to let the cycle of evil continue. And here's the challenge, church. Forgiveness means that at some level, we bear the cost of the offense. The emotional wounding, the scars are still there. But when we absorb its cost, a cycle of evil stops. Again, Tim Keller in his book, Forgive, he says this. He says, lastly, Joseph says, so then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them, his brothers, and spoke kindly to them. This is the action step. Joseph repays evil with good. Forgiveness is often, or perhaps usually, granted before it's felt inside. When you forgive somebody, you're not saying, all my anger is gone. What you're saying when you forgive, forgive is I'm now going to treat you the way God treated me. I remember your sins no more. That doesn't mean I can't actually recall them. It means I'm not going to act on the basis of them. They're not the controlling reality in my life. What is the controlling reality? The grace of God and the way in which out of love, he controls history. So can we, like Joseph, respond with humility? Recognizing the offense, yes. But resting in God's redemptive purpose, releasing the debt, and actually responding in active love and service to the other? The last four points there. I'm a, here, here's your homework. Read, read Romans 12, 14 to 21. And the last point there is live peacefully. Because I know if you don't get the last point, Makes some of you nervous. I, I want to leave us time at the end to just pray and reflect. I, I think Romans 12, you should read it. You should reflect on what does he say about bless those who persecute you. Don't repay evil with evil, but repay evil. I think it's profound. But here's what I want to do this morning. The band is going to lead us in a reflective song of worship. And one of the lines in this song says, forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Christ. And a couple things. One, I want you to reflect on the forgiveness of God for you. And, and forgiveness wasn't cheap, right? It wasn't just like God waved a magic wand and said, all is for you. No, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to bear in himself the penalty for our sin. The cost of our forgiveness was real and it was significant. But on the other side of that, I, maybe as we have talked this morning, someone's picture has been in your mind. Someone that you go, man, I need to offer forgiveness to this person, but Lord, I'm wrestling. In this moment, would you just begin praying, Lord, would you grace me to offer forgiveness as we reflect on the beauty of God's grace and forgiveness together?